Uh, it's Janet Fitch, and um, Writing Wednesday uh, was postponed this week because I did a uh, live um, virtual book club uh, for my last book, uh, The Revolution of Marina M. Getting ready for this week, this Tuesday, uh, will be the release of my new book, Chimes of a Lost Cathedral, which I just happen to have here. So Tuesday, uh, Times of the Lost Cathedral came out, so I did a virtual book club, and it's on my author page, as this thing is. So if you want to go back, uh, if you've read the book, there's a lot of spoilers, because <laughs> it was a book club. Um, but getting people ready for, uh, you know, their, their uh, memories recharge uh, for the new book. However, you know, if you've read, if you haven't read the new book, the first book, some people are rebels and they just want to jump in or if it's been a long time there is a cast of characters and sort of an update of where we are in the story uh, at the beginning of the book so awesome and I'm a little excited about that so but I didn't want to miss writing Wednesday so I um, moved it to Saturday and um, I what I do on writing Wednesdays if this is the first time you've ever seen us um, is I answer writer questions. Uh, why do I do this? Uh, I was did a recent interview asking me why I do this every week. I go up on, on Wednesday at noon Pacific and uh, um, three uh, Eastern, and I talk about writing. And the question from the interviewer was, why do you do this? Um, you know, nobody wants me to, you know, necessarily has asked me to do it. Um, but I had such a hard time getting a start as a young writer that anything I can do to make it a little easier for people who maybe aren't doing an MFA program, they're very expensive, you know, and would like to, um, you know, have the information that I wished I had 20 years ago. Um, so this is just my gift to the universe and uh, anybody who uh, wants to to learn a little bit more about writing and I'm, it's free to ask me questions uh, sometimes I lecture so this is writing Wednesday on Saturday I know it makes no sense but you know it was just postponed so here are some questions and I'm you know the people watching I am happy to take your questions so just type them in I'll see them on the uh, on the screen and answer them as best I can all right here it goes so my first question had been, um, um, as a writer, uh, should you try and get excerpts of your book or novel published uh, before you try to publish your book? Uh, I want to submit extracts to competitions, but I'm afraid it might cause issues later on if I ever try to publish it. Uh, no, it's not a problem. Um, most, uh, you know, a lot of uh, very well-published novels uh, have been excerpted, short stories uh, excerpted in literary journals while the person was writing it. They, they uh, sectioned off a piece of it, uh, put a an introduction and a conclusion made it more like a story and um, and published it so do not uh, worry about that uh, I think one of the things that uh, new writers hi Sophia um, I think one of the things that new writers worry about is um, protecting the story you know people are gonna steal it people are gonna do this you know if you if you publish a piece uh, you know a short story or an excerpt of the longer work that it's gonna make it more difficult to sell and that is not true in fact the other it works the other way around uh, the more people who see a piece of that novel the more likely that somebody you know because People in publishing are always, and, and agents are always looking at the journals to see who's good and what's interesting coming out. And there's more of a chance that they will see you. Now, I am not particularly big on contests because they have, they make all these hesitations in the writer's mind. I mean, if you want to go for a, a contest, go for it. But um, I think publishing pieces of it as short stories 
uh, in lit mags, you know, in the literary magazines is a wonderful idea. And why wouldn't you want to do that? So I would definitely say go for that. Um, here's another one. How do writers create different voices for fictional characters? We've talked a lot about voice in other character-related Writing Wednesday videos. You might want to go back on the page and, and see what else is there, but very in, in short. Um, every, write, every character is physically different. Their temperament is different, their energy level is different, their educational level is different, their attitude on the world is different. So if you really are feeling that character, you know, you've really gotten them, the dialogue will always reflect who they are. Somebody who is vigorous, has a more assertive way of speaking, uh, they... Um, it's a stronger voice, it doesn't trail off, it doesn't uh, gasp for air. Um, you can hear how, how strong or weak a character is in their dialogue, how educated they are, all that stuff. So that's how you create different voices for fictional characters. What do they do for a living? You know, somebody who works the racetrack is going to have a different set of metaphors than a plumber. Uh, they're going to describe a tough situation as, um, you know, a horse is, that chews on its corral as opposed to a clog of hair in a toilet, you know. So what they do changes who they are. It changes the dialogue, uh, what their temperament is like. Are they indecisive? Are they kind of vague? They would trail off. Often frequent apologies, sorry, I'm so sorry, you know. Uh, Poe, look at that dialogue, you know, he, or that writing. I mean, he is, he has got crazy people and who are like want to tell you but don't want to tell you, you know. So they tell you but they keep you away from the subject by adding, adding um, de dependent clauses to the beginnings of the sentences and keep pushing you away from the edge as much as they want to tell you, you know, they... They contradict themselves. So we've talked a lot about dialogue. Take a look at some of the other videos. Here's one from Annabelle. Cool. Uh, is it a good idea to hire an editor before I submit a novel to an agent? Or should I wait and then work with an editor via the agent? What you will end up doing in the process is getting that book as good as you can, which is, you know, I don't know if you have a writing group. Most people, I certainly work with a writer's group. And boy, when they're happy with something, I don't need to get an outside editor. Um, so I would just say use, the, use what you've got. If you have insoluble problems, you love the book, but you just can't see a way to solve that problem, uh, you might want to investigate a, um, a hired gun, a hired editor, but they are not cheap. You know, you're going to be looking at three, four, five thousand dollars uh, for such a creature. So, if you can get it as good as you can, and your readers, I want you to start using other people. If your readers are saying, "Yeah, that's done, babe. Is that good?" Um, then send it to an agent. Send it to many agents, not just one at a time. Uh, figure out who you're sending it to and send it out. Um, and what many an agent will take it and say, you know, I would love to represent this, but this is not done yet. And uh, you need to do this, that, this, and this. And if you cannot do it, you have to weigh whether you think they're right. And if they are and you're having trouble with it, maybe that would be a point to hire an editor. Um, so there are many points in the process, but I would say get it as good as you can. If you f still feel it's not good enough, you might investigate an editor. Um, hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Um, let's see what we have here. Um, When researching a novel, how is one so sure the supposed meaning behind it and its contents was actually intended by the editor? So that's a, that's a reader question about the process. 
how can a reader be sure that they really have understood what the writer intends? Well, uh, I would not have too much anxiety about that because a book goes out into the world. The writer stuffs, 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 stuffs it. And they finally get the lid on it. And then the reader opens it and everything opens up. And the reader completes the book by reading it and then bringing their own experiences, their own ideas, their own visualizations to the book and creates it anew in their head. So the reader is your partner as a writer. If you turn this around as a writer question, the reader is going to visualize it their own way. And as a writer, I feel I'd rather honor what people envision than necessarily tell them what I have in mind. That's the danger of writers doing book clubs with the readers and readers say, well, what did you intend by this? It's like, you know, it, it doesn't, does it matter? You know, I have a cousin who believes that, I, I wonder if she's watching. <laughs> I have a cousin who believes that Ingrid didn't really kill Barry in White Oleander. She just, because she's such an egotist, she thought she did. Well, I'm not gonna say, you know, my feelings about that because she's creating her own book and everyone, everyone creates their own book. And if you're a writer, I try not to contradict people in their feelings about the book and the way they create it in their heads. Um, I think it's much more interesting what they come up with. Um, I bet this is a student and, um, you know, is unsure about their own interpretation of the book. Don't be unsure. You know, you have a, you're the reader, you know, you're the co-creator, you know, go for it. Let's see. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Um, I have written books of poetry and they're self-published. Is that good for an agent to look at to get published as well? Um, poetry is an entirely different market and it traditionally poets have published their own stuff. So I don't know how uh, poetry publishers feel about um, self-published books. I imagine that they're quite sympathetic. Um, agents, an agent is a salesperson. An agent looks at your work and goes, can I make money off of this? So generally there's not a lot of money in poetry. So generally there is not an agent involved in selling poetry, um, which you know, it is not necessarily the case with fiction. So I don't think it it uh, it makes any difference <laughs> unless you got really good reviews. If it was self published, then you know uh, that will be a vo a vote in your favor. Um, let's see. All right, I've got some more questions here. As a writer, what aids for editing? do you find the most helpful and why? Now, aids to editing. I hope this doesn't mean Grammarly and all those online things. Uh, if you, if your command of writing isn't strong enough to be fairly confident in your own uh, the way you want to handle grammar, the way you want to handle that kind of stuff. You're better off boning up um, or just go for it. But editing aids, I'm trying to even imagine what that might be. Um, there are techniques. Uh, one of them is uh, to realize that it's never done until it's done and the editing process is a creative process as well. So instead of feeling, oh God, I've got to edit this thing and it's all done and now comes the grunt work. It's no, no, no. It continues to be a pre creative process all the way through. So bring that joy, bring that discovery, bring that, you know, 
to the challenge of editing. Now, what I one of the things I do is I make a list of kind of the levels of things I'm going to be checking for. I don't do it all at once. So the first level is usually smooth, ease of reading. Am I stumbling over anything? Um, then uh, the second one, the second read would probably be for um, the sensuality of it. Do I know where I am? Are there smell? I mean, I make a list. Smell, sounds, colors, you know, day and night, weather, you know, temperature. Um, and I read through and it's like, you know, is the world, you know, a visceral world? Sometimes you get so intense on trying to figure out what happens between your characters, you forget to do, you know, create a sensual world. Are the three layers of landscape there? Do characters touch things? And then do we move out to the big picture in and out? I mean, am I creating a dimensional world? So, and then... I will do an edit for just language. Is there word repetition? Are there better words than I've chosen? Have I used, you know, in this section, have I used a similar sentence structure all the way through? Do I need to break it up? Do I need big ones, little ones? Do I need to, to wrench the language around? Um, so you can see, so you could probably call that an editing aid or technique. Um, is to go through looking for certain things and watch the overused verbs, you know, the terrible 20, um, and really think about specifics. How specific can you be? And how melodic can you be? Read it out loud. That's the last thing. Read out loud. Is there music? You know, if there's no music, make the music. You know. So here's one, Heather. Have you ever considered adding a part two to White Oleander? Oh my goodness. I'm sure there's so many, so many people are curious to what Astrid is up to these days. That is so interesting. Somebody else has asked me. Um, never say never, but generally there's so much to think about and write about. There's, you know, there's so much that you want to engage with in the world as a writer. That I feel like I'm done, that White Oleander is a thing of itself. And I probably will, it'll probably remain that way. The only thing I could see is doing a um, Ingrid story, doing a prequel, like why the hell is she the way she is? I think that's more likely than coming to Astrid as an adult. I think she knows who she is and what she's doing. Well, this brings up a question that Jeffrey, Jeffrey, if you're watching, uh, that Jeffrey asked, um, are you open to the idea of crossover stories? Um, would it, Astrid or Ingrid ever cross paths with Josie? Uh, or e another character, uh, Lori. How about Rena Grushenko crossing paths with Lola? You know, the painted black, white oleander, um, uh, which is a really interesting question because um, I've seen that in books where somebody, a character appears like a minor flicker and then they're in the next book or in two books or they interact with somebody. That's kind of cool. Um, I think, but when I'm finished with a character's world, I really tend to be finished with that. Yet I could see a very, a, an older Marina in Carmel in the sixties running into, or Ingrid coming down from Berkeley and interacting with a 60 year old marina 65 that could be pretty interesting so never say never never ever say never <laughs> about anything that's life <laughs> just the thing that you say you'll never do is the thing you end up doing so who knows so jeffrey had another question um i know that ingrid was originally the main character of White Oleander. Yeah, there was no Astrid. 
when I, the first short story. Um, uh, would you ever consider releasing it to the general public? That short story is in uh, a journal called um, uh, Black Warrior Review uh, out of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, so it was published in, I think it was 95. Um, and it was a short story. I no, it's before that. That was that had that had Astrid in it. Um, I don't think it was that good a story. You know, I think it needed it needed Astrid to be a really fine story. I don't know if I would. Uh, maybe I could, you know, if I could find it, I might put it on my website uh, in in the White Oleander section. And um, question three. Uh, before White Oleander, back when you were just writing short stories, is there one that you've considered expanding into a full-fledged novel? Well, Paint It Black was a short story uh, that uh, was expanded into a novel. Uh, that's a very likely thing. You know, White Oleander was a short story expanded into a novel. Marina M., was a short story called Room 721 in Black Clock that um, I didn't actually write the story. I wrote the backstory, which became The Revolution of Raina M. and Chimes of Lost Cathedral. So got a lot out of that story. So I'm writing short stories again. Uh, I'm writing a noir story and I'm writing a sci-fi story. So who knows uh, if I might end up writing a novel, you know, a noir novel. I, I kind of like that. I like noir. Um, so here's Shona. I wrote two books traditionally published in HarperCollins, and they've done well. Now I'm suddenly paralyzed. Oh, I'm so sorry. I moved cross country, and for a whole and a whole year has gone by. Oh, I find I'm out of my comfort zone. Is your writing space sacred, or can you write anywhere? I have written every book at this in this actual seat that I'm sitting in right now. I built the bookcases later, but except for early short stories, I have written everything here. I do when I can't write, I do go other places, but I got to say I come back here to do the serious concentration work. Um so I don't think it's sacred. I'm, I'm really, uh, I try not to be ritualistic or, you know, uh, too precious about where I work. Um, I've certainly worked in other places, but there's something about having all your books around you and to really be able to, for me, really be able to settle in. Uh, I, um, I think, you know, creating a soft space for yourself, um, even if it's not forever. Um, if you're living, if you're living somewhere new, you know, of really sitting in that chair hour after hour after hour, read in that chair, eat your lunch in that chair, you know, really start spreading your psychic, uh, ambiance uh, in that place. Do some meditation. Get pictures of your favorite auth like the authors who are sort of you think of as your tutelary spirits and you know sit on the floor and contact them. And, you know welcome them into your new space. I mean uh, I'm pretty space. The space is really important to me. Um, I think if I moved I'd be doing that same thing in the new space, kind of preparing it for the work, but not in a superstitious way, um, just as something uh, that I'm a kind of, I mean, if, I don't know if anybody is into astrology and, you know, I know a lot of people who hate that kind of stuff. So if you are, don't judge me. But I'm a fixed sign, which means I have trouble when I'm moving around. I do like to feel settled to work. So um, I get a lot of information when I'm traveling. I do research when I'm traveling, but I tend to really get down into it when I am at home. 
So here's another one uh, from Amanda uh, about the way, thank you, the amazing way I set the tone in the beginning of White Oleander. Can you speak about setting the tone in a novel? Very, very important. People take too much from short story writing and movies, which, you know, have to start on a dime. You're like, Pshaw! and you're all of a sudden in me to rest. You know, you just begin. With a novel, you don't have to get off the blocks like that. Uh, with a novel, you want to signal to the reader that this is going, that they're entering a world. And you want to bring them, at least I, I want to bring the reader into a world. I want to set a mood so they kind of know what book they're re going to be reading. You know, I, I, I think of it as constructing a doorway and then entering the doorway. Uh, so I do not believe that you have to, to um, get off the blocks that quickly. You know, that's short story stuff. Um, you don't need to do that. It, it shows a lack of confidence that the reader will join you and that they'll have a little patience to watch it un unfold for themselves. Now, by page 50, you better have something going on. But you want to to start off and bring the reader into the world. That's To me, that's very important. I did that. I even have a pro prologue for Marina M. Because I wanted to not even, I mean, seeing it's a Russian novel written for Americans, I started in America and then brought you into Russia, uh, into her past, uh, so that the reader can really be located and understand that the, that the, narr the narrative voice is going to take care of them, that they're not going to be lost, and then allow the world of Marina to open up. So I think that's, that is super uh, important. You're establishing your diction, you're establishing point of view, you're doing quite a bit of stuff at the beginning of a novel. Uh, and I think it's putting out the welcome mat for the reader. So here's another one. Um, how do you, um, as a writer, how much of your world building never makes it into the story proper. Now, this is a sci-fi... Uh, I think this is uh, about a sci-fi writer asking about world-building. But all novels are world-building. You create the... Sl Even if I'm writing Contemporary World, I'm going to... You know, what, what part of... What are the... What part of the world am I dealing with? What are the rules of that part of the world? Am I writing about, you know, Skid Row, L.A., uh, 2019? Am I writing about suburban Cincinnati in 1990? Uh, wife swapping and, you know, that kind of thing? Is it, is it an angry divorced household with a lot of secrets? Is it a marriage that looks good at the beginning? You're always world building. So, and the thing that I'm very careful is I ask myself, what does the character, especially working historically or sci-fi or uh, especially those two um, worlds that aren't our world, um, is what is the character how does the character see what do they notice and what don't they notice one of the things i think is it is something i really dislike about bad his not bad but historical writing that is not to my taste let's just put it that way um is that the background becomes foreground they they are so interested in how in this car and that telephone and how it works and explaining to you how it works and all that they're showing all their research. Um, but a character from that time wouldn't be thinking about that. So you have to put yourself as if the novel, say historical, is being told from the point of view of somebody living at that time. And what would they notice? Story is foreground. 
all that stuff uh, is background, and I believe the same should be true of uh, science fiction, that you should um, talk about, you know, the robo-health. I'm writing this sci-fi story, you know. You write about, you know, people getting checked with robo-health. You don't have to sit there and explain how it works. You have to figure it out. That's what this writer is asking, you know. Yes, you have to do all that work of world building, but you only show enough that it makes sense to the reader, and it's stuff that it's being taken for taken for granted um, uh, by the character. Nobody, you know, I also call it. It's like those movies that are historical, and they kind of they kind of lick the scenery. It's like, ooh, ooh, look at that period, this and that period, that, and it's like, but that's not how people would see it in those days. Uh, so you want to write it as if it was written by the, you know, in those days. You know, what would they notice and what would they not? Um, so yes, how much of world building that doesn't make it about 90 percent doesn't make it but it gives it what it does is it gives a consistency because you know that world you know the rules so everything is going to be consistent the reader is not going to go hey wasn't that you know uh called video health what is this robo health you know you can't contradict yourself so you have to know it very well and then the consistency will be good. And the reader has a sense of confidence that the writer, that this is a real place. It's a real place. Um, and that ha the writer, ha if you don't know, or if you're still licking the scenery, if you're still excited about what you just researched, got to cook it a little longer. What else can I... Okay, here's one. Um, when writing characters with disabilities, should you mention the disability when first introducing the character? Really good question. Oh my God. How do I make sure to introduce them respectfully? Well, it's different if you're in first or third, if you're in an omniscient, point of view where you, the writer, have to say things versus a close third or a first person point of view. If you are have a character who is, say, blind and the, you know, if you want to have the reader understand that they're blind without saying, God, I'm so sick of being blind <laughs> or Harry was, you know, had been sighted as a child, but now he was completely blind. Um, There's so much more subtle writerly ways to do that. You know, somebody who's losing their vision, you know, you put the paper far and close and finally just threw it down. It's like he'll get Mabel to read it to him later. Clearly somebody whose vision is not good. They stumble over stuff, you know. He only saw the vague outlines of that whatever. So it's a lot like world building. You know, you want to know very clearly what it's like and then just give little pieces of reality about it rather than declarative statements about it. What is it like to live as a disabled person? You know, Charlie wheeled up to the curb. You know, in this town, they still didn't have cut curbs. You know, it was like going back to 1962. Oh, his arms ached, blah, 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 you know, and having to ask somebody to help you. So the deeper you are into the character, the more natural this will be. Uh, this is not a disability walking around. This is a person walking around with limitations and frustrations and anxieties and desires, just like everybody. All right, anything else from you guys? Hi, Zunaid, greetings from South Africa. Uh, okay, very cool. So I'm, I'm taking questions, here we go. Is there a book that uses 
a first person narration, but splits it among two or three characters. Yes, absolutely. The Poisonwood Bible, there's like seven of them. Uh, you just make it clear who sometimes people will just say Ruth, you know, Leah. And then sometimes just the voice is so clear who it is that you don't need to even identify it that way, uh, which is the best of all possible worlds. It's like clearly the stammering, hesitant, apologetic, um, denying, you know, uh, lying character, maybe, oh, that's Charlie. Uh, and then the, uh, the more abrupt, you know, cut to the chase person is, oh yeah, that's Jason, you know. Um, but yes, that happens all the time. Um, and uh, it's very fun. It's very fun to read. I really enjoy that. Uh, let's see what we have here. Another one. Um, what is your favorite novel set in a single day? Well, my favorite novel set in a single day is Ulysses by James Joyce, set in a single day. Three main characters, uh, two, actually two main characters, and then one, thro you know, one thrown in. Um, Leopold Bloom, Stephen Dedalus, who is the younger man and is the alter ego of Joyce. Leopold Bloom is a middle-aged man who sells classified advertising for paper, and he's a very kind and generous person, but he's kind of bumbling through life. And then his somewhat adulterous wife, Molly, who gets the last chapter, and that's the best one. But every chapter in this book takes place on one day. It's June 16th. It's called Bloomsday, and it's a big holiday in Ireland now. Ireland, who didn't accept Joyce when he was alive. Uh, he had to leave the country and write this in France. But now, you know, it's, it's a holiday. I mean, Bloom, to go to Ireland, to be in Dublin on Bloomsday, you know, is something I've always wanted. Uh, so that takes place, and there's a different voice and time of day in each chapter, different, whole different language, diction, everything, and, um, and it follows the Odyssey. And so each chapter is a section of the Odyssey lived out on a single day in Dublin in 1904 uh, or 1906. Um, so that is probably the most brilliant. Also, there's everybody who's been watching me knows that Under the Volcano is one of my very favorite books by Malcolm Lowry. It takes place on the Day of the Dead uh, in 1938, um, as the British consul drinks himself to death on the Day of the Dead. Uh, what a brilliant book. And that's a, that's a musical book. It's all about the, these amazing images which build as they recur into this motival structure that is, um, it's peerless, uh, peerless. And then there's a uh, day in the life of Ivan the Misovich, which is a day in the life of a prisoner in the gulag um, in Russia. And he also wrote the Gulag Archipelago, it's Solzhenitsyn, uh, which is, there are two books, you know, like 800 pages each about the atrocities of the, um, of the Gulag. Um, but in a short, really short book, Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich is probably under 100 pages, if not, well, maybe 100 pages. But you become so closely invested in this one person's day and all the, the struggle for existence, this one guy, that to the point where he gets a fish head in his soup and you just, you celebrate with him because he got a fish head. Um, so those are three novels set on a single day uh, that I think are tremendous. But if you have a favorite, do write them in the comments because I'd love to see what your favorite single uh, single day novels are. Um, so yeah, I've I've used up my questions.
Uh, so if you have any more questions, I will sit here for a second and uh, tell you what's going on with me. And um, uh, I'm prepared to take another question or two. So um, what's happening with me? Uh, writing Wednesday will be irregular for the next month or so. I have... Uh, uh, I'm going to be away teaching for two weeks, so I'll fit it in when I can, and depending on the internet, uh, when I actually can. Um, and on the sixteenth, uh, on the second, on Tuesday is is opening day for Chimes of a Lost Cathedral. So if you enjoy these Writing Wednesday videos, you know buy my book. That'd be awesome. Um, and uh, then my book tour starts uh, on the 16th and uh, on my website there and also on Facebook. Uh, my tour is uh, is there. And if you'd like to, you know, if you want to come out and uh, support me or say hi, or, you know, I, I would love to see you there. Um, and uh if you can't make it to a reading, um, if you live in some part of the country that's far from where I'll be, you can uh, contact any of the bookstores that I'll be reading at. Buy a book, I'll sign it for you, they'll send it to you because there's still a post office, thank God. <laughs> so in any case, uh, I wish you good writing, I wish you good summer, and um, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Oh, wonderful. Okay, bye.